Welcome to Masters of Engineering. Uh, we take a look at cool products, the people who develop them and how they do it. I'm your host, John Hirschtick, and I've spent my entire life building CAD systems. But the best part of my job is that I get to meet some of the coolest product developers on the planet. And in my podcast, you get to meet them too. I'm really excited about our guest today. His name is Ben Eady. Ben is a master user of CAD. He's done a lot of very cool things in his life, but probably the coolest thing that we're going to talk about today is he builds props in props, I guess you call them, for movies. Yeah. Movies you've seen and heard of, TV shows, Star Trek, Ghostbusters. If you saw Tom Hanks on opening day at the Cleveland Guardians baseball game, um, you'd see you would have seen one of Ben's creations. Ben, welcome to the podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure, John. It's great to great to chat with you again. It's been a little while. It has been a while. I've <laughs> known Ben for years, and he is just one of the most creative, interesting, um, <laughs> tremendously full of personality and knowledge. And I, you know, I, I'm so glad to be back in touch with you. There's so many things we could talk about that you've done, but you've built. I mean, you're like got this like dream job building stuff that actually goes into movies and TV, yeah. right? Very much yeah. so. It's a it, it, dream job is an understatement. I, I still like, you know, 12 year old me every day is screaming inside, losing his mind. <laughs> 12 year old you. So you haven't <laughs> lost the 12 year old you. That's yeah. really good. So look, the most recent thing that got us back in touch is I had heard about and then was lucky enough to see Tom Hanks on opening day, Tom, the Tom Hanks on opening yeah. day at Cleveland, the Cleveland Guardians baseball game. Yep. He had this this Wilson the, from his movie Castaway, right? The Wilson yep. ball. Tell us about it. Tell us what. Tell us first of all. Tell everyone what it was who hasn't seen it, and it's right. on YouTube, right? They just Google search. Yep. So uh, Tom had gotten a hold of me through a mutual friend, and um, he said, wait, I wait, wanted... wait. "Tom had Tom <laughs> Tom Hanks had gotten hold of you." So, so you're hanging in this circle of movie you know, stars. It's, and and for me, it's kind of a normal in in a little bit. Like you know, I I still get starch struck, but yeah, it's the circles I hang in. They're just a bunch of other people too. And once you're sort of in there and you're known as the guy that gets things done, then you get these these calls from. Um, well, it started with Adam Savage and I worked on Ghostbusters together. Um, he helped out a little bit. And... Adam Savage, now the Adam Savage from yeah. MythBusters. I mean, we're not going to have enough time for us, but <laughs> so you right away you got Tom Hanks, you got Adam Savage from Go uh, from from MythBusters yeah. that you're working on with, for Ghostbusters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, at any rate, when we worked on Ghostbusters, we got along really well. And we stayed in touch, which was like, for me, you know, I was a huge fan of Adam before and I still a fan, but like now I can call him a friend, which is, it's, it's bizarre. I, I still think it's, it's strange, but you know, I'm, I'm good with it. But he called me up and said, Hey, you know, um, I got a, I got a guy that's looking for a robot ball and I can't do it. Can you, can you maybe put that together? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? And um, so he's like, okay, so I'm going to put Tom Hanks in, in, you know, give Tom Hanks your number and, you know, there's dead pause on the phone. It's like, pardon. <laughs> but um, yeah, oh, it was literally, wild. Yeah. A few minutes later, Tom called me up and told me, you know, he gave me the pitch as far as like, um, no pun intended, but he gave me the idea of what he wanted, which was to show up with Wilson and Wilson to be sort of, you know, nobody would know that he's not just a ball, um, you know, come on kind of confused. And then, have Wilson run around like a petulant child. And I'm like, yeah, we can totally do that. Um, this is one thing I'm known for is that literally I got off a phone call yesterday with a guy and when everybody else says it can't be done, they end up calling me because I'm too dumb to say yeah, to, too dumb to say no. I'm like, You're okay, it dumb. sounds like a challenge. It's, you know, I'm going to probably need a whole bunch of antacids, but let, let's try it. Um <clears throat> Anyways, uh, he asked me to build the robot, had lots of time, worked on it, uh, developed it, this guy here. And with the help of, um, I called some friends. So anything I do, I want everybody to understand, anything I do is always as part of a team. I'm generally the forward facing yeah. part of the team. And when I say I or me, it's rarely, in fact, it's almost never I or me. It's an entire team. So um, Ian Bernstein, he's a, a, an engineer, but um, well, actually, you know, I don't know if he's an engineer. I think he's a... Uh, you know, a crazy inventor like me, but he's the guy who came up with the Sphero robot. 
Um, and so through mutual friends, I found out about him, asked him if he could help out. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I've got the platform for you. So he came up with this guy. And, you know, it was awesome for... What, oh, what is that? Let's see it again. No, oh, it's right here. So what is that? So this is the guts of Wilson right here. We've got um, oh, the, a so that's in the here. guts of it. Yeah, and this yeah. is this is a, this basically a rotating axle which hooks directly to the outside of Wilson. We need when you're doing props and effects, uh, you want something that is super robust. Could have we made it super whizzy and put like a almost like a, a omni wheel on the inside, and made it omnidirectional? Absolutely. Would it be hard to fix if it broke down? Yeah, scarily so. So on stuff like this where it's high stakes is you make it super simple. So we've got nothing more than a weight and a servo to swing back and forth. So if this was the ball and it went like this, it would start to tilt. So you do this to turn mm. and then the ball will tilt left or right and forward motion is covered by this servo here. So it'll rotate and as it leans, it'll curve off to one side or the other. <clears throat> really That's simple so design. Cool. That's yeah. so cool. But aren't, aren't most products, you know, don't, don't most products want to be designed to be simple? You would think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is one thing where I, I always look at stuff and, and, you know, there's a point where you got to realize that if I was going to design it, all I'm going to do is redesign it and put in problems that I designed versus problems that somebody else designed. It's not going to be better or worse. It's going to be, different right but there are the designs where you look and you're just like you do not need all these bells and whistles you do not need these tolerances like uh, so you know you have so many cool things i'd love to touch on a few of them and then get into sort of your process yeah. and how but um so star trek beyond was yeah. that one of the first movies that you you worked on it was the first movie it was well, the first movie yeah uh, so I, on and off, like in the past, I was part of like, say, Calgary Search and Rescue Association. I was one of the founders of the Search and Rescue team here in town. And um, they, we got hired for Last of the Dogmen. It was a movie way back when. I can't remember the actors and everybody, but um, they needed a rescue scene and we were there. So I've done that. Um, the first three Superman movies ever made, they were done in my hometown. So there's a chubby little 12-year-old guy in front of everybody in most of the crowd scenes. That's me. Okay. But but yeah. as a as a prop, do you say you build props or special effects? What would you describe? What's this the... is where I am a little different than most people. Is I sort of bridge the gap between props and effects. Um, mm. Props generally need to have things pretty and good for camera look. Um, then effects obviously makes everything move. But there's a lot of times where these two things intersect quite a bit. And when you intersect, you have two groups of people with two different visions causing problems. And um, I've got enough of an artistic vision and the ability to paint and make things look good um, at the same time being able to engineer and put it all together. So for complex things um, that are integrated, like a robotics thing, like say the Wilson robot or on Ghostbusters, I didn't design and build, but I did a lot of modifications for the ghost traps and for the for the proton packs, for um, the remote trap vehicle, um, all those sorts of things. And because I can sort of speak both languages on both sides, um, I generally problem solve. So my credits will generally be props or effects, rarely both. Um, but it's I'm just. I'm just a bridge, really. <laughs> a bridge between props and effects. So you just mentioned, let us let me get a little more detail on this. So let's go back to Star Trek Beyond. What did right. you do? What exactly did you build for them? Um, okay, so in Star Trek Beyond, you see the you see them in the Starship Enterprise getting tossed in, to and fro when they're getting attacked um, in space. And what they did is we built full-size sets that sat inside of giant rotating tubes that were... 40 feet in diameter and 35 feet in diameter, about 100 feet long. We put the sets inside and I made them rotate to left and right, or basically as a cylinder rotating around. If you go on YouTube and you Google um, Star Trek Beyond behind the scenes, you get some really good shots of, of these rotating sets. And again, huge that right team now. to make that happen. But uh, yeah, that that was I was kind of the head of that. And that was scary and amazing. <laughs> You worked on site, right? There's no other way to build it, I assume. No, you know, it's, yeah, you work on, on site, but like our office and where we manufacture a lot of things in that in that circumstance was a little ways away from set. 
So I do a lot of traveling to and from, you know, I do all the design work and stuff in the office. Um, certain things would be prefabbed and, and sent out. Um, and then, I, you know, I'd go to the set and, and work on it there. You know, and this is one thing um, is that Onshape was in beta testing at the time. Yeah. And I was invited to play with it. Um, it made me look like a freaking superhero. I'm telling you, because <laughs> I... <laughs> I was on set and there was modifications. People are freaking out because there's some major mods to be done. You're doing this giant thing and not all the parts are working together. They never do. But I would make a modification to the 3D model while standing, looking at the at the rotating set, go back to my office and literally just go and print off the drawings that I just got and send them back. And people are like, how did you get that done so fast? We're figuring this is going to be a two-day delay. And you were like an hour later, you have drawings. For oh, it. that's great. And and because you don't lose context and you can use the iPad while you're sitting there or your phone to make those subtle corrections without, like I said, losing context, it's it changes the game. Oh, that's so nice, dear. I mean, of course, we're, we're I'm really glad you, you love yeah. Onshape, you know, and, and that we can be used. And there it is, you know, mobile, on set, on scene. Yeah, so much of our customer base is about saving time. It's mm -hmm. about not having to take the extra, you know, the extra four hours or the extra day, or I'll see you tomorrow. It's about doing it now in the moment. It's about not going back to your office or back to your desk. It's about yeah. doing it where you are whatever computing device you have and everyone in the world who's working with you seen it. But let me ask you, so, so that's a giant one for Star Trek, very different than building the Wilson robot. Why oh, yeah. you can see a spectrum of, of but you mentioned Ghostbusters and mm -hmm. ghost traps. Tell us more. What else, what do you build for Ghostbusters? This is just so cool. Oh, um, they had, they had all these really high end electronic props that, you know, we had a props, group that was not really keen on taking care of all the electronics and stuff because that's not in their wheelhouse and we had a bunch of effects people that were swamped with what they already had they needed somebody to just sort of sit in between and babysit all these pieces and and that's where i fit in um and you know i did get to build and help with a few things but predominantly all the pieces were made in different prop houses in la so um, you know, they, they build them. I'd come and spec them out, ask for certain modifications. And then once we got them on set, my sole job was just to make sure they worked every time. And minus, minus one piece, I, I think I actually pulled it off. Um, I see. So that's interesting. So it's not just about some of your job is not just about designing and fabricating, but making sure essentially being the, if I may, the general contractor or the mm -hmm. systems engineer. Yeah. to make sure it all comes together, which is a lot of our, you know, a lot of products that are built are assemblies of other things that, yes. you know, of course your suppliers. And let me go to um, Arrow and Legends of Tomorrow. I have to confess that if, if anyone has, does not know Arrow, it's this fantastic show on the CW network. It's it's done now. They, they finished. Yeah. It's ran for, I think, seven seasons. So anyway, the reason I mention Arrow is um, I watched every episode of every season of Arrow and the reason I did that was I have a, uh, a teenage son. He's not a teenager anymore. And this was a way to bond with him. And he said, Dad, I, you know, I'm like, what are you watching? He goes, you can't just start at the beginning. You, you can't just jump in now. You would have had to watch all the episodes. And so I said, how many episodes are there? And he said, 27. You know, and I'm like, so I started watching them. But anyway, so my son is thrilled that I'm talking to you, Ben, because he's a huge <laughs> fan. I watched every episode. So tell me, what did you do for Arrow? So in this case, I was I was hired in effects, but I was doing on set effects. I was helping with the smoke and making sure that certain effects were being run properly right on set, um, implementing, you know, things like they'd say, well, we need, you know, uh, a certain amount of smoke to blow past at a certain time. So you have to time it and work it out on set. Uh, they shot an arrow into into this hotel and the hotel blew up. Um, we We blew that one up in the studio and it was... Wow, it was energetic. <laughs> and Legends of Tomorrow, which is a, a like spinoff show from Arrow. Yeah. What did you do for Legends? Um, that again, I was running Smoke and everything. Okay. Uh, again, don't know the episodes or anything, but it was an old nineteen uh, forties to sixties era military encampment that I was helping okay. with. And there was mortars and stuff landing, so I was helping with uh, making sure that the exploding mortars that land and blow up, you know, they were something that was you know, safe to be within so many feet of, um, again, the, the pyro and everything was done by somebody else. I was just making sure that the, 
the schmutz that you put on top of the explosive was safe to hit somebody, you know, cork and, and dust and everything. Uh, and then, yeah, other than that, literally out in the bush, rolling out what looks to be a roll of, of garbage bags, but it's just a long, huge tube. And then hooking up to a giant fan and then sending smoke through it at the right time. And uh, yeah, just, just okay. a lot of that stuff. So, um, okay. Let me, let me talk to you about some other things. How do you get into the movie business and where were you in your career? Cause I know one of the things on people's minds, you know, any product developer, maybe our listeners is, mm -hmm. you know, where's, what's my career path. And I think yours is pretty interesting. If, if you share like where you, where you came from, where you were in life, yeah. when you got into the movie business. Well, you know, just, I, I find a lot of people are trying to script their life and I've, I've tried not to script my life. I try to go with the flow a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, it allows for you know things like this to happen a lot easier, at least uh, less friction, I suppose. Um, the way it started was is I was working like you know I'd done a whole bunch of online tutorials in 3D CAD and had my own website and everything. I was doing fairly well on it, but I was burning out because I was doing the same thing over and over again. And it, it just you know I'm I'm severe ADHD, borderline on the spectrum because it's just the way I'm wired um, and. It, it was too much to do the same thing over and over again. And I had run my, a freelance sort of engineering consultancy since like, I think it was about 2000 I started and it was 2015 by the time I got into the movies. Now, one thing I, I do on the side is pretty much engineering again. I love building contraptions and everything. So I, I was hanging out at a, a makerspace, a local makerspace, and a few people were working on um, the Revenant. And the special effects supervisor was saying that he needed a, a crazy designer to help him out on some stuff. And of course, everything's, you know, hush, hush and quiet. You can't really say what it is, but you can talk about what you need. Mm -hmm. And so um, Janet Mater got a hold of me and she said, hey, I, I got a guy looking for a crazy designer. And like, you're the first person that came to mind. And I'm like, well, thank you. Um, uh, of all the projects that you've done, which is the, which one was the biggest challenge? There is no option for failure. Yeah, like, no you know, option. It, it's got to work. And if it doesn't work, they will force it to work. Like, you know, if that giant rotating set didn't work, they would have literally hired a thousand people to hang onto the hoops of that thing mm -hmm. and drag it up and down if they needed to. But the, the most challenging design wise would have been the rotating sets for Star Trek Beyond. But then I started getting into car flippers and car cannons. So these are things that will flip a car as if an explosion went out underneath them. So I, I worked on a whole bunch for the last Predator movie that was out. So these car flippers um, and, and car cannons, they're reasonably easy. It's getting the timing, everything to work properly with them. But the thing is, is that I'm taking people that are now very good friends of mine, like say the stunt people that are driving, and I may have just made a death machine for them. So oh, making it gosh. safe and stuff is so paramount and, and the level of stress involved in this. And then, you know, embracing that you've got people out there that are, are trusting you with their lives. And that is very, very humbling at the same time. Um, so so a, car, a car flipper, you mean, as it's driving, it would create some load that would... Yeah, so like the, if it's coming along like this, so say the back corner, like the, the back corner, you have like basically a giant piston with, uh, you know, three or 4,000 PSI of, of nitrogen behind it. Okay. And it slams that piston down and it'll send the vehicle over onto its head. So, it okay, that's a, that's a car flipper. And you said the other thing you mentioned was a car cannon. Okay, so what we were talking about was the, sorry, the, the car cannon was the, the, the piece that goes down. So they call them car cannons because in the past they would literally put a metal tube with a chunk of telephone post inside of it with a charge behind it and would just cannon out and flip the vehicle over. Okay. Um, what we came up with or what I modified off of um, another guy who kind of came up with the, the main ideas, this Al Waldron, is a piston that would go out um, and it doesn't shoot shrapnel everywhere and you don't have to worry about protecting all the camera people um, uh, or you don't have to worry about an errant high-speed telephone pole flying through the air. Okay is he made a piston that slams down into the ground. But as the vehicle's flipping over, there's a mechanism that reverses it, sucks the piston in. So by the time the vehicle's upside down, the piston's been retracted. Nobody can see anything. So editing uh, becomes a huge bonus for these people. And uh, you have a background 
before all this, mm -hmm. you were in the military, right? You know, I, I joined a, a reserve unit in, in Calgary called the Calgary Highlanders, and I was in there for almost seven years. An awesome learning experience. I was even in there, I'd find like equipment sucked. So I would just, I'd redesign it and make it work for me. And of course, then I would get, you know, people like, Hey, can you make that for me? And, and, you know, later on in my, my career, um, or not in my military career, but when I went into design, I was asked even to make some military parts for certain vehicles and stuff like that, because, because of my notoriety for just modifying mm -hmm. stuff. And did, did you think that the military prepared you as an engineer product developer in a way that, you know, in a special way that you wouldn't get if you hadn't been in the military. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, especially in the movies, um, it ingrains a chain of command in your head. And there's a very good reason in certain circumstances, not all, but in certain circumstances, the chain of command is critical for things to happen and being able to follow it or navigate within the chain of command and, and knowing sort of the rules, uh, it's huge. Um, I What amazes me actually is why the movie industry isn't all ex-military people because it was one of the first jobs where like when I went to Star Trek and I looked at the way things were laid out and who was in charge of what and where people were, um, logistics and transport, I was like, this is, this is just the military without bullets. And it was so easy for me to navigate. I just kind of fit in and I'm like, I That's get it. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to train me for anything. I'm good to go. Um, so yeah, any, any military people out there thinking about doing stuff, I'm telling you, go, go look at the movie industry. It's, it's a, it's an environment that you're very familiar with and it's very easy hmm. to navigate. It's interesting. So there is a <laughs> synergy between military and movies. Yeah. Why do you think we don't see more military veterans in the product development world? Like I, I would say they're underrepresented. Would you agree with that? I do. And it all depends on where they're coming from. So I'm infantry and, you know, like it or not, there were a bunch of grunts. And um, I was one, because I was in the reserves, you know, we, we had people going to college and university. Um, so you, you get that. But if you're going to the regular forces and stuff, you generally don't get that higher education stuff. Um, and there's always that, that entrance to a lot of companies. This is one thing too, is if you're a boss and you see that there's a designer out there that knows how to do 3D CAD, ignore any paperwork you have you got to take him for what he can bring to the table and investigate that because mm -hmm. as long as he's not signing off engineering documents he might be the guy you need not not the guy with the papers and sorry about the guys with the college papers but you know i i see so many times very talented people not being where they need to be because they don't have the right paperwork but that all being said, i mean like degrees and things you're saying yeah. i mean just to say you know it's a Maybe maybe there's a little difference in nomenclature when you say the, the papers. You mean the the degrees? The yeah yeah no yeah, exactly. The, so yeah. going back to the whole point is that when you get the infantry guys coming out, you know they're good with weapons, they're good with explosives, they're good with you know different things. There's not a whole lot of real world jobs that involve these things. So you're gonna find that a lot of these guys end up in in like construction jobs. Um, they'll be in police forces, ambulance, like a lot of first responder type jobs. Mm -hmm. You're gonna find a lot of excellent. Makes sense. Right there. I've met some unbelievably talented people in the movie industry. And we had a conversation about this with one guy. He said that he we didn't get along a little at, at first. And part of it was, is that he was upset that I was, I had like engineering and stuff. And he goes, if you get fired from this job, you can go find an engineering job. If I get fired from this job, mm. I cannot make anywhere close to what I'm making now because I don't have any papers. I don't have mm. anything. I am only just this guy that works in effects. And it terrifies me because he goes, I know you're going to be successful. I don't know if I will. And I, mm. they saw me originally as, as the guy that was potentially taking a job away from somebody that, that really could use it. Um, mm. And, you know, I, I understood and respected that, but at the same time, it's, it's a place I feel I belong. So that's kind of where I'm staying. <laughs> um, an, another topic I want to ask you about is I saw um, that on, I think your LinkedIn profile says You've achieved four world's records. Yeah. Your um, design work. See, what are those? Right there. Let's see that, that picture there. Um, oh. It's a, a pedal bike that we made aerodynamically efficient. Um, okay. My biggest thing was to make sure that all the aerodynamics and everything are good. So my engineering field is aeronautical engineering. Uh -huh. um, so airflow and stuff is something I can, I can understand. 
And we took this bike, made it recumbent, and uh, Greg Kolejusik rode it for 1,046 kilometers in 24 hours under his legs alone. Uh, How many miles? 600 miles in 24 hours on legs alone? Yeah, yeah. So That's amazing, and that's a world record. Yeah, that was a world record. And while he was making that record, he did there's it's um, uh, it's called the Mega... I can't remember the prize, but basically it's the fastest time to a thousand kilometers on a bike. He did that while he was obviously you okay. see how far so those are two records in one <laughs> yeah. ride. Then um, we worked on a pedal boat. So we had a, a pedal powered boat and mm -hmm. had that in a uh, Glenmore reservoir and in a reservoir here and did the same thing. We, we uh, did the longest distance traveled in 24 hours, which was 250 miles or kilometers. I can't 250 recall. either way. I yeah. Mean, it's, in a boat, yeah, in twenty four so, hours, pe person powered, yeah, and then you know this is one thing where it's amazing, it was heartbreaking and not heartbreaking. It was kind of funny because as soon as the guy got out of the water, Greg got out of the water, and we broke the record. Um, I I looked at him and I'm like, while you're doing this, I had an epiphany and I think I can make this better. And a year and a half later, we shattered that record. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, so those so those the four records related to the yeah bicycling and the boat human powered i probably knew some of that but that's so cool ben so cool yeah. so you've built a lot of things in your world of we've been focusing on in in um in the 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 props slash effects mm -hmm. world of movies and tv shows but you also know a lot about regular product design most people who are going to listen to this are not designing special effects you know what advice do you have for someone who's making a a more what i'll say traditional kind of product it's a great and difficult question all wrapped in one one box um i think number one would be to simplify everything always look at yeah. like what is the end goal and if something is not serving that end goal it needs to be removed um mm -hmm. i've seen too many times where you know like say 3d printing you have the 3d printer that's also a laser cutter that's also a cnc machine um with a you can mount a, a router onto it and have it carved it will do none of those things well. Can it do all of those things? Yes, mm. but it does none of them well. Make single-use mm. items, like a, or not single-use items, it's such a bad term, but like a, a single vision and, and do that one thing well, and you're going to find that that will, will help. But making it simple, like if you don't need a, a button to turn on the light for the panel and the panel can just turn on when you know that the guy has hit a button, remove the turn on the, the mm. panel button, like mm -hmm. get rid of everything that you can to make it simple. Um, and, you know, one thing I see a lot of people doing is that they, they design it, especially new, new people designing is they come out of school thinking everything's got to be tolerance everything's got to be mm -hmm. perfect fit size on size. You know what, make it sloppy, 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 unless you're dealing with something that is in medical industry where you require this stuff, make it so it's sloppy and the reason why you want to make it sloppy is is that it will always work when everything else is you know why does the volkswagen beetle still drive you know i drove a volkswagen beetle on two cylinders 600 miles to get home to fix it and mm -hmm. why because it was sloppy and clunky but it would always still just work i'm sure i could have driven home on one cylinder make a product that can handle that right and if you do then you're going to be successful because um, you know, we always in the the movie and movie industry and in, in effects is is it actor proof is the is it the term. You know, is it you, actor proof? Yes. Can you hand it to an actor and are they going to break it within a few seconds? Then if yeah, you know, hand it to your kids. Your kids, the way they destroy toys, have nothing on an actor. Nothing. Okay. <laughs> These people will look at it. They'll fall apart. I got to I got to say, I could talk to you um, literally all day. What a fascinating set of stories. I want to say to you, first of all, it's great to reconnect. You're such an interesting guy. I want to thank you for coming today. Congratulate you on breaking into a business that is kind of a dream business yeah. for, you know, for many people, you know, working in the movie business is kind of a dream. It's not just something that you, you just do. Um, and uh, let me ask you, if anyone wants to learn more of your work, mm -hmm. more about your work, um, I know they can find you on LinkedIn, but do you have a website? 
Um, you have a URL we can point I, people I to? I don't have a website, but I'm, website. I've really been focusing on YouTube and just producing videos on, okay. on the tips and tricks and everything that I've learned in building things. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's, it's maker oriented, but that being said is that the design and the concepts of it, um, I think, come through quite well. And your YouTube channel is um, is uh, just under your name? Yeah, it's just Ben Eady. Ben um, Eady. Okay, yeah. great. And I just did a search for just Ben, E-A-D-I-E -E on YouTube. Yep. Search for Ben. You got uh, some great videos. Uh, so I want to, you know, thank everyone. Thank you, Ben, for joining us today and taking time, you know, taking time away when you could be chatting with Tom Hanks or... You know what? I prefer talking Adam to Savage. Like you. Oh, well, that's nice of you to say, or <laughs> hanging out on the field at the Guardians game or whatever. But I just want to thank you for joining us today. And to our listeners, thank you all for, for, for listening in or watching on YouTube. Um, you can listen to other episodes of Masters of Engineering, this podcast, at uh, or subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you like to find your podcasts. You can also find us. We're now doing these on video. And so some of you are just listening, but others are watching the video of me and Ben talking here. You can find that on YouTube. I love hearing what you think. So make sure you leave a review of this episode and tell me what you thought of Ben and his story. You can follow me on Twitter at J Hirschtick. That's J H I R S C H. T-I-C-K. That's it for today. See you all next time on Masters of Engineering.